Hello. Um, if you don't know me, let me introduce myself. My name is Ben and I'm a member of Avenue Community Church. And it's a real pleasure to be able to share God's word with you wherever you are. And I wonder wherever you are, um, if you like to feel special. I know I like to feel special. Um, whether it's a card through the door, a gift, a birthday celebration or an award, someone has recognised my value and taken the time to make me feel special. Now, believe it or not, I turned 30 this year and it's very likely to be a birthday unlike any other. But that hasn't stopped Louise, my wife, from uh, planning a load of things to make the day special. And she's done that to show me that I'm special to her. I mean, she also really likes planning surprises, but mostly the thing about making me feel special. But why am I talking about this? Well, we're continuing as a church to look at this amazing verse in 1 Peter um, that describes the new identity of God's people, the church. We've already looked at how uh, we are a chosen people chosen by God before we ever thought of choosing him. That we are a royal priesthood, given intimate access to God um, and a call to bring others near him. And that we're a holy nation, called out, separate, citizens and ambassadors of this glorious eternal kingdom of God. And this week we come to this phrase, we are God's special possession. What does it mean to be a special possession? And moreover, not just anyone's special possession, but God's, the creator of the universe, eternal, all-powerful, perfectly loving. What does it mean to be God's special possession? Let's look at this phrase in two parts and first think about what it means to be special. And what I hope we'll see by special is this that we are treasured by God. Now, when we see this phrase, God's special possession, we might think, well, doesn't God own everything? Isn't everything already his? What makes us special? That's it. That's the key question that we'll come back to. What makes us special? Uh, Louise and I have been blessed recently with our very first home. Uh, You can see a lovely wall behind me here. Uh, And along with the house, we own pretty much everything inside it too. Now, things like toilets, uh, radiators, sinks, they're important possessions, but I wouldn't call them special. Um, My my guitar, on the other hand, or my A1 size Times Atlas of the World. Now, they are special. Um, But why, you might well be asking, they are after all just a fancy wooden box and a load of pages stuck together. What makes them special? Well, they're special because I value them. I, I get joy from them. In other words, I treasure them. And what are we but a bunch of ordinary people Bodies and bones made from dust and returning to dust. What is man that you are mindful of him? Uh, Asks David of God in the Psalms. And the unsaid answer is, we're nothing. We're nothing to be mindful of. And yet we have amazing verses like the one we're looking at. And similarly, back in the book of Exodus, where God is speaking to the nation of Israel through Moses, God himself says this, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. And it's now no longer you will be, but you are. You, the church, my chosen people, my royal priesthood, my holy nation, you are my treasured possession. We are a people that God values, that he takes joy in, that he treasures. I just want to pause there for a minute because it could be really easy to rush over that. 
God doesn't simply love us, he treasures us. A couple of years ago, there was a John Piper podcast episode that I listened to called I Know God Loves Me, But Does He Like Me? And that really struck a chord with me at the time. Yes, sure, God loves us. He, he is love, so that makes sense. But does he like us? Does he want to be with us? Does, could he ever take pleasure in us? And the amazing answer is yes. God loves us, but he also likes us a lot. And if you're not convinced, just listen to a few verses from the Bible here. From Isaiah 62, this is God speaking to the nation of Israel again. You shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. From Zephaniah, the Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. And then Psalm 149, which says it about as simply as can be. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. God doesn't simply love his people. He delights in them, rejoices over them, sings over them. Think of your most treasured possession perhaps not a guitar or a, or a big atlas. Think of the thing that gives you most joy and you now have a, a tiny idea of just how much joy God gets from us. We are treasured by God. But why God, why? Why do you treasure us? Why are we so special? The answer is simple but profound. To paraphrase a slightly cheesy song, we are special because God loves us. We are special because God loves us. And the follow-up question to that is surely, well, why does God love us? And the answer to that is perhaps even more profound. God loves us because he does. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, speaking again to the nation of Israel, repeats the words from Exodus that I read out a minute ago. And then he goes on to say this. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you are more numerous than other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you. And we, the new church, the new Israel are no different in this respect. Why are we here? Why am I a part of God's people? I can personally feel really entitled a lot of the time, like I deserve special treatment because of things I've done or simply because I feel special. But when I think about it properly, what was there in me that made God choose me? Nothing. He chose me because he loves me. And he chose us corporately to be his church, not because we are better than anyone else, but simply, profoundly, because he loves us. Now, wonderful as that is, without the next part of the phrase, which we come to now, we might just have to accept that God loves us. He said he does, he said we're special, so we should believe it. Now, I wouldn't say that that was wrong, but it would be hard to believe without any kind of evidence. We know love to be active, don't we? Um, if I say I love you and that you're special, it's hard to believe it unless I actually show it. I, I could tell my wife daily that I love her, and yet if I don't show it to her in the way that I treat her, is she really going to believe me? When we think about being God's special possession though, we wonderfully see that love in action. And we see that God has made us his own. God has made us his own. We see the lengths that God went to, to make us his special possession. If we go back to that verse in Exodus, we see a problem. 
You see, being God's treasured possession is conditional. God tells the people of Israel that they will be his treasured possession if they obey him fully and keep his commandments. Complete obedience and faithfulness to God are needed for them to experience this amazing new identity. But we know from continuing to follow Israel's story through the Bible that they failed again and again to be faithful to God, to walk in obedience to him. How were they ever going to be this people that God had promised if they couldn't obey? And how have we ended up here in 1 Peter talking about how we are these things? I don't walk in complete obedience. I'd be very surprised if you do either. When did we ever see complete obedience and perfect faithfulness achieved? Well, we see it achieved in this living stone, which Peter describes a few verses before ours, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. And a few verses before that, we read of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. This is Jesus Christ, God the Son, living in perfect obedience and perfect sacrifice, achieving for us what we could never achieve for ourselves. Titus puts it like this, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own. That word redeem means to ransom, to free someone by paying their worth. And that phrase at the end there is exactly the same phrase that we're looking at today, a special possession. We were never going to do enough uh, to be good enough in order to be God's special possession. And so God did it for us. God gave himself to make us his own. And this is what it costs God, death on the cross. This is what we were worth to him, so much that in Jesus he would sacrifice himself, take the place that we deserve to make us a special possession, a people that are his very own. I'm sure many of us have watched the Toy Story films and in it, Woody and the other toys belong to a boy called Andy. And they know that they're Andy's toys because they have his name written on their feet. When we become part of God's special possession, his church, we're said to have his name written on us. Yet, unlike Andy's toys, we have in some ways always belonged to God. You see, God's people, they were made by God, uh, and then they decided to leave God's house ended up for sale in some grotty shop looking like who on earth would buy these things. And then God came and bought us back for an absolute fortune. In fact, he gave everything he had to buy us back. And then he wrote his name on the hearts of those he bought back in the most permanent of permanent markers. Made by him and bought back by him. We are doubly his. We really are his special possession. We are treasured by God, a God who has made us his very own by paying the ultimate price. What does this identity mean for us? How does it impact the way we live our lives? And how, as the next part of this verse goes on to say, how does it help us as God's people to fulfill this purpose of declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Here are just two things to, to focus on as we finish. First, you are special whether you feel it or not. Whether you feel like God treasures you or not, he does. You, his church, are his treasured possession in whom he delights. You're special simply because he loves you. Nothing you did made him love you in the first place. And so wonderfully, nothing you can ever do can make him stop loving you. 
look at our culture and society. Don't we all want to stand out from the crowd to be special? How much of the advertising industry is built on that promise? Uh, wear these clothes, drive this car, take this course, and you'll stand out from the rest. You'll be special. How much of social media is a, a desperate cry to, for the world to look at me? Tell me I'm special. There'll always be something to do in order for the world to see us as special. And who knows how long that recognition or that feeling will last. But Christian, if you are part of God's people, it's already been done. Because of Jesus, there's no more you will be if only you are so that so that what? Uh, so that we might declare God's praises. And how do we do that? By being his special possession. Well, think about it like this. When we recognise the specialness of someone in a worldly sense, whose praises are we declaring? Theirs. We praise them for what they've done or said or how they look. But... What about us? What about God's people? If I tell someone that I'm special and they're not, you can imagine the kind of reaction that it could provoke. But if I explained why I'm special, well, it's completely countercultural. It's not about anything I've done. It's about what someone else has done for me because they love me so amazingly. Let me tell you some more about him. Now, you, you might not have such an upfront conversation as that. But simply knowing our specialness and knowing where it comes from will help us to live lives that are noticeably different. We can be so different to our culture. Not trying to prove our specialness, not living in fear of not being special enough. We are special, whether we feel it or not. And yet, our specialness doesn't result in boasting or feeling better than others. It produces humility. This is a strange quality to the world, but it's really attractive. This humble assurance of being special. This is something that the, the world really wants and strives for. As we live out this humble assurance, whether speaking it or simply living it as a church family here at Avenue, we are declaring the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light for no other reason than he is amazing and loves us. And in doing so, we're calling others to come into that light too. Secondly, and I'll leave us with this, what belongs to God will always be his. What belongs to God will always be his. We've already looked at the lengths that God went to to make us his very own, to make us his special possession. And the Bible makes it wonderfully clear that God will never let go of his own. From Psalm 94, the Lord will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. And from Jesus' own words in the book of John, this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. All these amazing words from Isaiah chapter 43. But now this is what the Lord says, he who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. What belongs to God will always be his. I'm sure that that was a wonderful encouragement to Peter's readers 2,000 years ago scattered across modern-day Turkey, uh, facing a hostile culture around them, 
and an uncertain future before them. Well, as someone in our home group this week pointed out, today the church is even more scattered than it was 2,000 years ago. And, well, let's be honest, we're even more scattered right now than we would be normally. Some of us have been able to meet up physically, and that's great. Others of us haven't been able to, and probably won't be for some time. This is a, a scattering like we've never really experienced. And in addition to that, the surrounding culture is still mostly hostile, or at the very least dismissive of the gospel. And, well, do we face an uncertain future? Have we ever known a time like this one where we don't really know what's going to happen next week, let alone next year? I'm so thankful, uh, especially now, that we've got these amazing words written by Peter, reminding us of who we are and always will be, whatever happens. And I pray that you too might be encouraged, knowing and remembering in the week to come that we are treasured by God, a God who has made us his very own forever, a God who looks on us as his special possession.